Good morning, everybody. I'm so sorry, I can't get my camera working, but I will just get started and we'll see if we can figure it out. So I apologize for being a disembodied voice for a moment, but I would like to say good morning and welcome you to our third town hall Zoom presentation. I'm Emily Farber. I'm the Director of Social Services at Avenida's Rose Kleiner Center. We are the Adult Day Health Center in Mountain View. Avenidas wants you to know that we are here for you in a variety of ways. All of our staff are providing critical support to make sure that you have your needs met. Please take some time to review our Avenidas website. It highlights all of our Avenidas Without Walls programs and resources. Many of our recreation classes are now available online. And for elder care consults and crisis intervention, we have social work staff through Avenida's Care Partners, and I will have their information up at the end of the program. Please note that this webinar will be recorded and available on our website, avenidas.org, within the next day or so. And our first two town hall presentations are already available on our website. So today, we will have a short opening by Dr. Merdad Ayadi. Dr. Ayadi gave us a detailed presentation earlier this month, and he has agreed to join us today with updated information. As we know, things are changing on a daily basis, and we really appreciate his time and expertise. Dr. Ayadi is board certified in both family and geriatric medicine, and he's the director of the Geriatric Center of Los Altos. So I'm going to turn it over to him at this time. And um, as I noted, just a housekeeping issue, all of the participants are going to remain muted at this time. And if you have any questions or concern, please use the chat function. All right, thank you for your patience. And Dr. Ayadi, we can get started. Thank you so much and good morning, everyone. Um, I'm gonna just make my presentations to be available. Let me just a second. Okay. Can you see my uh, PowerPoint here? COVID-19 updates uh, mid-April. Okay, perfect. Let's go start with uh, some updates because I wanted to be, um, again, respectful to the time of our uh, speaker, next speaker as well. We talked about uh, COVID-19 for the last uh, uh, two weeks and there's definitely, there's been some changes going on. Um, the lesson we've learned from COVID-19, we all of learning as a daily basis. And I use the term of no time to grieve. This is something that I'm actually currently writing about it. Uh, the reason I'm writing is just my personal story. Uh, at the beginning of March, I lost my own mother. Uh, and that was because of the sudden diagnosis of cancer uh, back in my home country, Iran. And I was not able to go and see her because of the COVID-19 situation. And at the same time, I lost my cousin, who is a very healthy young physician uh, who got actually contaminated in the hospital and um, he, uh, when he was taking care of his patient and left behind of the two little kids. But um, when I was personally, uh, uh, again, thinking about all the grief that I have, the COVID-19 became a pandemic in our area. And I've been involved with uh, many community works through the uh, again, senior care, um, uh, many of facilities, they're suffering from lack of personal protective gears. And there's a lot of the, um, the scariness actually came to our community at that time. And that, uh, uh, again, made me to really not having a time to grieve. That's why the story that actually I'm writing um, so far, and I'm waiting for the next weeks to finish it up, but kind of like a lessons that we all learn and we may have another time for a presentation of this. Now, talk about um, what's going on in the community right now. Currently in uh, Santa Clara community, we have total of the 1,666 uh, patients, uh, 45 new cases, total death of 60, and for the last 24 hours, we have six deaths again. 
In the uh, United States, we are around 614,000 till last night and 26,000. Sadly, many of them is actually happening in the East Coast and many of them actually, they're seniors in a skilled nursing home facility in New York area, uh, which makes us very sad. But the number are uh, surpassing of 2 million today with 128,000 of the death um, globally, um, which is, um, uh, again, it's just, um, again, going, um, it's, we, are, we are thinking about entire world, we are reaching to the curve, but it's still we are having a number of the death and uh, new cases. One of the, I'm just answering some couple questions here and then I'm done with my um, update. Do we build um, immunity after exposure? This is a question many people ask me these days. And again, the answering to this question is really still unknown. And the reason is that um, our immune system actually currently, uh, uh, we are, uh, and, and that's very important because the response is very different in, um, about the different germs about the immune system. Like for example, we all knowing that if you get chicken pox when you are um, a child, then you can actually be immune for the rest of your life because you technically have activating memory cells to uh, produce and that's gonna help you to protect from that. But when you get common cold, you actually don't get immune to common cold because the rhinovirus um, or the virus that actually are um, uh, mutating so fast. And this is why we um, do not develop any immunity against common cold. And um, we, we are developing antibody against COVID-19 infections, we, but we're not sure that if this antibody that we're producing is going to be protective for the long term. And uh, in one study done in 23 patients that they have COVID-19 and they have um, technically antibody to the uh, receptor domain, which is a spike of the virus that we discussed uh, um, in the past, 14 days after onset of symptoms, but the, um, and that antibody had neutralizing effect. When we talk about neutralizing effect, because we have two types of antibody, I mean, this is very specific about the, um, of, uh, again, science of that, but some of the antibody are just binding antibody. They can actually um, 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 attach to the part of the virus, but they may not necessarily helping that we get rid of the virus, but the neutralizing antibody, as you see here in this picture as well, they are the one that technically makes the virus to become absolutely ineffective. And um, they are uh, attached to the virus. They, they, they um, uh, not let the virus to get to the cells, or even if they get to the cells, they degrade this, uh, the virus very well. And this is exactly what we need. This is exactly is going to be the answer or magic bullet even when we're producing the vaccine that we need to have neutralizing antibody against that. We know um, uh, we, um, there we are currently doing a plasma transfusion to some of the people that they recover and we're getting plasma from them and transfuse to the other people. As you probably know, the plasma is the uh, uh, yellow part of the blood that is uh, technically um, when we don't have any red blood cell, white blood cell, is only have the yellow part and antibody and some proteins in there. Now, in the case series that has been done, the people that recovered, the plasma donors, I think I discussed it last week, they recovered completely from COVID-19 and they were on, and they actually donated to the people they've been on mechanical ventilation and see how is that. They found that, that when they transfused that, uh, this patients, the number of the virus in their nose area is actually decreased. Um, and the oxygenation after 12 days of the transfusion actually improved. But again, this finding is not established as a casual effect. We is still, one of the pl pr problem we have is the time after you get the plasma from the people already get affected. Currently, the American Red Cross is helping to collect and distribute to convalescence plasma through the country. And this is something that is ongoing when we're hoping that we get some more data probably in the next weeks when we talk. And um, we have some preliminary uh, uh, results in, um, um, uh, in China showing in um, some sort of the apes that we, when they infected with SARS-CoV-2, they didn't develop the reinfection again uh, following the recovery and the challenge of that. 
But again, this is not a study has been published in peer uh, review journal. It was just published recently. And, and we still waiting for further confirmation of this finding, but that gonna come up with some of the idea of what's going on. You're probably here for the last uh, three days. Um, some people that actually they got infected in South Korea, they actually reinfected again. And that was uh, one of the concern that is going on. We still need uh, waiting for data to come and then we can have some more answers to that in the probably next weeks when we are, especially for the countries of like um, China, and in Wuhan, it's specifically in Wuhan, the people got infected and they reinfected again. How long this antibody is going to be protected in their body? And then we can have uh, a lot of uh, my patients ask me about Stanford tests. You probably hear the Stanford tests. They are um, uh, developing uh, and they already have around the capacity of 500. They checking the antibody in your blood that if you have already exposed to this virus and you're not aware of that, you have been absolutely asymptomatic, mean no symptoms, but you already got the infection. Um, uh, the scientists in Stanford Medicine, they uh, detect this test to detect the antibody against the novel coronavirus SARS-CoV-2 blood sample. They detect both IgG and IgM and um, to, to a spike, which we talked about it last time. And it's very different with the rapid tests that they're doing through the immunofluorescence. The test is, um, have several limitations. First of all, it's um, not a known that if you response that we talk about it by, um, again, response with IgG or IgM is really protective. This is exactly what we have. The rate of false positive, um, it can be high, especially in the patient who have other inflammatory problems. Uh, we still don't know about that. That's why they, they found an IgM of in these people, they may do the swab nasal test as well. And, um, and this is something that uh, they're currently are doing it, launch it from April 8. And um, uh, there are, there's still discussion about who's going to be the candidate for this stage. Are we going to do it for only healthcare workers right now? But currently they're doing for even patients. They are wanting to do the blood test and with the very high capacity to see that. But honestly, about um, translations of the result and all this stuff, there's still a lot of questions, but I think it's a very good starting. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy that currently we have this ability to do this test. Uh, one of the things that I, um, uh, from mid-April, it's a face covering, which is now mandatory. Uh, it's not a mandatory, it's actually in many countries. In, in the United States, just recommendation. Um, in the area that the social distancing is hardly to achieve, like for example, if you go to a grocery store and somebody else is shopping next to you, it's uh, recommended to have definitely face covering. The only um, uh, thing is like, for example, if you are, walking in the park like or walking outside of the street and you already know that you're going to be six feet away from the other people you don't need any face covering but if you are going to indoor area that you think that definitely um, somebody going to be close to you the recommendation is that using it but very important thing that face covering as we talked about it on the couple of weeks ago is not going to be uh, preventing you from not getting the COVID-19, because COVID-19 is very a small um, particle, is very small virus, and, uh, um, and even it can uh, pass from the face surgical mask. The only thing is N95 respirator can actually prevent it. The most important thing, which I've seen a lot of people do the mistake, is removing the mask from your face. I see the people, when they remove the mask from their face, they touch their hands to their face and eyes, just you get infected as well because your your mask getting the virus and is and is staying there and then you start to touching the outside of your uh, face cover mask and then you're touching your face. It is very important whenever you come from outside and you have your face cover or mask, uh, uh, drop it somewhere or put it for the wash if you're using any uh, face cloth, and then at the same time wash your hand 20 minutes 20 seconds with soap and water or use any alcohol. Um, um, disinfected things. And that's a, one of the things that we've noticed a lot of people actually may get infected because they think they have face cover and they can touch their hands to their face. Um, a lot of people ask me about the hydroxychloroquine and malaria uh, medication. Is it helpful? Is it not? You know, that uh, use of this uh, guideline of uh, data so far yeah, we talked about a couple of weeks ago, even till today, we really don't have any sufficient data 
um, I just saw CNN this morning and um, had some uh, reports about that uh, can be heart, uh, very, very uh, dangerous to the heart. I strongly recommend for anyone that if your doctor is recommending to take this anti-malaria medication, you should, they should make sure you don't have any heart problem. Definitely, I will say the baseline EKG is so important, especially when you combine it with antibiotic azithromycin based on a study that was in France, because the combination of these two medication can be very, very uh, fatal and can really make the situations to get worse. And again, um, 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 this is the rapid review just published in April 7. It's from the United Kingdom and Oxford. And again, it's showing that we still need a lot of data to approve to, uh, about this medication. Remdesivir, uh, which we talk about it the first time that it uh, helps the enzymes to, to stop. This is from Gliad, compassionate use of remdesivir. In a study that's been done, and Stanford was part of that in the phase three, it shows some um, um, effectiveness. I'm not saying that 100%, but uh, in 53 people that they have severe hypoxia, they follow them and they found some, um, some of them have clinical improvement, um, some of them they're not. But overall, I will say it relatively has been satisfactory for using this medication. It is important that when do you use it and when the people get to the hospital and start the treatment, if they have no side effect or they have no contraindication to uh, using this medication. I wanted to thank you so much. And again, you can uh, email me, contact me if you have any questions. And I will be with you again next week with uh, my uh, wonderful colleague, Dr. Marina Martin from Stanford. She's a section chief of the Stanford uh, Geriatric. And we will talk about the topic that uh, she and I have been in media for the last days um, regarding uh, um, 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 uh, issues in the nursing home and uh, outbreak in the nursing home area as well. Thank you so much, Emily. I appreciate it. I will be back for your questions time, but I'm still with you. All right. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, Dr. Ayati. And um, I do want to express my deepest condolences to you and your family from all of us at Avenidas. And uh, my thoughts and wishes to all of you who may be tuned in today who have experienced loss in recent weeks or have a loved one who is ill. Thank so, you. I appreciate it. Joining us. Um, at this time, I want to introduce our main speaker. Um, and Dr. Ayati, if you want to stop sharing your screen here, although that's a sure. whoever that is. <laughs> the cutie. So our main speaker today is Dr. Ellen Brown. And Dr. Brown is a pioneer in developing the role of hospice physicians in the Bay Area. She has served our community by providing care in the home to thousands of hospice patients and to their families in her 20 years uh, during her time at Pathways Hospice. She's trained countless Stanford Palliative Med Medicine and Geriatric Fellows who are now providing care throughout the United States. Dr. Brown has shared that her favorite part of the job is spending time with patients and their families and finding out what's important to them at the end of their life and helping them achieve those goals. She feels it's a privilege to be welcomed into somebody's home and to be present during these inspiring and intimate moments. And we are so glad to have Dr. Brown here today to talk about these personal uh, decisions and complicated issues. And so she, I'm going to turn over the conversation to her and she's going to leave ample time for questions uh, towards the end of the program that you uh, can enter through the chat feature. So thank you so much for joining us and I will unmute you in just a moment here. Okay, thank you. So Dr. Brown, you're all set. Okay, thank you, Emily. Um, and I also um, want to extend my deepest condolences to Dr. Ayati on both the loss of his mother and cousin. And um, my heartfelt condolences go out to you. Um, thank you, Emily, for that lovely introduction. Um, and I want to thank Avenidas for inviting me, um, and especially Paula Wolfson, the manager of Avenidas Care Partners, for inviting me to give this talk on difficult conversations at end of life 
during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I, uh, as Emily said in my bio, I've done so many end of life conversations and I believe they are incredibly vital. Um, but during this pandemic, when the, there is this heightened anxiety, the threat of severe illness seems more real, I think these conversations become even more urgent. I believe these conversations can be empowering and hopefully provide some peace of mind to lessen the anxiety. Um, as we are sheltering in place, often isolated from our friends and our family, I'm hoping to give you some tools, both how to have these conversations with loved ones. Um, they may not be able to be in person at this time, um, but also give you tips on what to think about and how to get these conversations started. Um, I have very few PowerPoint slides, but at the end of my talk, I will show some links to other resources to help you with these talks. Um, they are resources on how to think about starting a conversation, how to have the conversation, and important things to think about. And I will show you those resources at the end. And as Emily said, give you plenty of time to ask questions. The reason why I have many options for you in these resources is there's, I wanna stress there's not one right way to do this. And different um, tools will work with different people and will speak to you better. So as a hospice and palliative care physician for over 20 years, I've had many conversations with people about end of life. But I think during the pandemic, there are some unique aspects and I want, I'm gonna talk about both generally conversations, but what makes this time so unique? And this was brought home to me by a recent conversation I had with a friend who called me to talk about her parents who are both in their late eighties. Um, neither of them had COVID-19 her mother had some mild cognitive impairment. Her dad had some heart and lung issues. And they had already done their advanced directives. They knew they did not want to go to the hospital during this time of the pandemic where they might get isolated from their family um, or they might get infected with COVID-19 if they went for another reason. But her questions had to do with, can I make sure they can be comfortable at home can I make sure they can get the medicines they need to make them comfortable during the pandemic? Um, how do I, are there hospices out there that can help me during the pandemic? And these were very different questions than I had heard before. And it really struck a chord in me on how we have to tailor, um, both as family members and as physicians, tailor our conversations to this specific time. The more I thought about it, I, I'm not so sure I like the title of this talk, End of Life Conversations, because I'm a real believer that these conversations have to take place way before the end of life. Um, and I will go into why I think that's so important and how that can both um, give you more knowledge and control over your life, um, as well as giving you more power. Um, this is a, an opportunity to talk to your family or loved ones about what's important to you, what matters to you right now in your life. And hope, you know, not just at the end of life, although that's a piece of it. It's always helpful to have these discussions before a medical crisis occurs, because then everyone, the panic is high, the anxiety is high, and hopefully having the conversation um, at somewhat of a more calm time will make it easier. During the pandemic, there's so much uncertainty and anxiety around. My hope is that these conversations can give you more control and lessen the anxiety. One of the things you can certainly control is who gets to speak for you 
if you can't make medical decisions. It's never too soon to pick this person. The term healthcare proxy is somebody who gets, who makes, can make decisions for you if you are not able to. And literally the only, um, you can't pick somebody under 18, but other than that, at any age, you can pick a healthcare proxy. What if you were to get into an accident? What if you couldn't speak for yourself? And there are studies that show that people over age 65, more than 50% of them cannot make medical decisions when they are admitted to a hospital. So choosing someone to speak for you is one way to get some control. During these unusual times, you might also want to choose a backup agent in case your first agent isn't available or can't get on the phone or Zoom chat with your doctor and have the phone numbers of your agents handy. So what makes a good medical decision maker? What should you be thinking about? A good medical decision maker is somebody who can talk to your doctors and be your advocate. It's somebody during these times who probably won't be able to meet your doctor in person, but can get on the phone or video chat with them. Will this person be okay making a decision based on your wishes, even if they have very different wishes? That's something to think about. This, they can't be afraid to speak up. If they don't understand what the doctor is saying or don't understand the situation clearly, they have to tell the doctor, hold on a minute, please explain that better. So this has to be someone who isn't afraid to speak up. This is someone you trust to follow your wishes your proxy or agent doesn't need to be a medical expert. In fact, most people aren't. But they have to be somebody who can apply your values and your goals to the circumstances and make decisions that are consistent with your values. So it's important, first of all, that you let whoever you've chosen as a decision maker Know that you've chosen them. It can't be a secret. They have to know and agree to this role. But the second thing is, if they're going to be speaking for you, then they have to know your wishes and your values. And that's the second part of the conversation. I love, there's this Goldilocks type story. And this is from the, con I want to give credit to the conversation project. And that's one of the resources I'll be giving you later. And it talks about a woman who's trying to find who can be the right decision maker for me. And she goes to her husband first. And her husband says to her, well, I'm not sure what you really want, but I just want to let you know that I can hold your hand for 20 years, even if you're unresponsive, I can never take you off life support. And the wife says, you know, that's a little bit too hot. Uh, that's not exactly what I want. And then she goes to her son who says, well, mom, I know you don't want life support. I will never put you on life support under any circumstances. And the mom says, you know, that's actually a little too cold. That's not exactly what I want. And then she goes to her daughter who says, mom, I've heard you talk to me about this and this, I know what's important to you. It depends on your prognosis. It depends on what the doctors say your chances of survival are. And that will help me make my decision on whether you should go on life support or not. And the mom says, you know, that's just right. That's perfect. And you're going to be my decision maker. Um, so that illustrates a little bit about wanting to make sure whoever you chose is going to be speaking for you and is listened to you. So if this decision maker, as we said, is going to be able to talk to your doctors and reflect your wishes, how do you share those wishes and values with them? 
during these times, if it's not somebody living in your home, it may have to be done over the phone, but that's okay. And if you really feel like I'm not ready to have this conversation, some people practice by writing a letter to themselves about what they may want or what they're thinking about. Or they maybe practice write, writing a letter to their loved one because they're not quite sure or they're not quite ready yet how to put it in words. Um, and, it, and while this time does lend some urgency about doing it now, you have, you have to be somewhat ready to have the, the conversation. So I like to think of some simple prompts. How do, you know, how do you even get started? And one of the first ones is what matters to you or what matters to me? Um, I can tell you, I have, as a physician, I have had some of these conversations with my patients um, and I encourage them to think about this myself. I know as a doctor, I would never know the answer to this question unless I asked. Um, sample answers, some people have said, my independence matters to me. Um, a clear mind matters to me. Being at home, being able to say goodbye. Um, I clearly remember a 96-year-old man um, who I was talking to and I asked him this question and he totally surprised me with the answer. This was a um, retired engineer. He was the patriarch of his family, um, a very dignified gentleman. And I, uh, and at this point, he was near the end of his life. He was um, bed bound in a hospital bed in his living room. Um, and I thought he was going to say something about his dignity. Um, he was requiring help with personal care at this point. And he said to me, I don't care about that. I don't care that my son-in-law has to change my diaper. As long as I have a clear mind and I can give advice to my grandchildren and my children about what they should do, that's all important. That's the only thing that's important to me, my mind and being able to give advice. Um, his children were, who were sitting with me were surprised to hear that because they also thought it was going to be more related to his dignity. But I could tell you if I hadn't asked the question, none of us would have known that. And we really, did all of our medical decisions based on keeping his mind clear as long as possible. But what matters to you is very personal. And that could be the start of one of the prompts. Another prompt, what are the important things in my life? Could be family, hobbies, pets, gardening, religion. Um, again, very personal answers, but helpful for your loved ones to know, again, is my, is my, whoever is speaking for you, are they going to be able to continue to do the things that they love and that are important to them? And it helps for them to know what those are. Um, some additional questions that um, are frequently asked when closer to the end of life are, what do you hope to accomplish during the time you have left? And again, very personal answers may involve travel, may involve completing a project. Um, other items that to think about, uh, and these are more of items on a scale. Where do I stand on how much medical information I want from my doctor? Um, and a scale from one to five with one being, I just want the basics, give all the rest, give the, the detailed information to my family, or I want to know everything. Don't keep everything for, from me. And again, this is helpful conversations you might be having with family as well as with health providers. Other things to think about. Where might you want to be at the end of life? And again, a scale. I'm okay with being in a hospital or a facility. To the other end of the scale, I really want to be at home, if that's possible, surrounding by my, by my loved ones. I often think that having this conversation is almost like a gift of love to family and friends, because then they don't have to guess 
on the things that matter to you and that are important to you when they acting as your agent may have to make medical decisions. But how do you even start the conversation sometimes when you just don't know how to break the ice? Um, and again, I wanna give credit, the uh, Conversation Project has a lot of good icebreakers. Um, and it might be something like, I need your help with something. Or, you know, I'm fine now, but I wanna be prepared. I'm worried that something might happen. So this will help me be prepared. Can I talk to you about something? Um, and and those, are, those are a couple of ways to get started. Or you might say, you know, I heard about so-and-so and they ended up in the hospital and couldn't see their family. I wanna make sure that doesn't happen to me. Can you help me with that? Let's, can we talk? Um, and those are some possibilities. Many of you, I'm sure, already have advanced directives. You may have a, a POLST, which is a physician's order for life-sustaining treatment, but it might be a good idea to review them now. Um, during the pandemic, your, some of your uh, decisions might have changed. Maybe whoever you chose as a healthcare agent might not be as available right now. And actually, it's always good to review who you've chosen. I've, I've heard every 10 years or so to review. Um, and now may be a good time just to check and see who did I choose? Do I have a backup? Um, you might have at one point said, I wanted to go on life support. And think about the details now of life support during this pandemic, especially if you get COVID-19, are different. It's always been um, hard for people who, as you get older, surviving um, a ventilator. But the information of people over uh, 65 and certainly over 80 who develop COVID-18 and end up on a respirator are truly horrifying in terms of survival and in terms of what it does to one's lungs. So it's something to think about. Am I okay with being in a medically induced coma on a ventilator? Because while in the past being on a ventilator, one didn't assume you'd be in a coma, what COVID-19 can do to one's lungs with respiratory distress syndrome usually means that the person will have to be in a coma while they are on the ventilator, and it may be two to three weeks. Again, something to think about if you've made a decision at one point, the, the reality today with this disease may, is very different. Again, there are lots of medical questions that a health provider might have for you or your agent, but the underlying theme behind is what do I value most about my life? And how should my medical care reflect that? What is most important? Trying every treatment that's out there, being comfortable at home. Again, that is the thread that underlies a lot of these scary medical questions. What are you most worried about is something also to think about and either discuss with family um, or discuss with your health provider. Um, while at this point, most regular physician visits are not taking place in person, many physicians are available via Zoom chat and calls if you do have concerns and would wanna discuss with them. In fact, at this very moment, the um, California Coalition for Compassionate Care is having a talk for physicians how to have these conversations with their patients. Um, and how to do it with empathy. To, you know, because a lot of doctors are not trained in having these conversations, but there's a lot of information out there right now to train them fast, to, because it's important that these conversations take place. Um, other questions to think about more unique to the pandemic. If you do become sick, do you stay at home or do you go to the hospital? Is it something that can be treated easily? Will you need to be admitted? These are, uh, and then if you're admitted knowing that if you are in the hospital, you probably will be isolated from your family. Many people are choosing to stay home um, 
and not go to the hospital at this point. Other questions to think about. What is helping you cope during this difficult time? And how do I um, strengthen those things that are helping me cope? If it's faith and religion, are there ways to connect online with your faith community? If it's the support of friends, again, uh, connecting online, or simply getting information with these town halls by Avenidas, because knowledge can be power and help give you a sense of control. These are difficult times um, and there are difficult questions. Certainly when people get sick and go to the hospital, it can be frightening to be isolated. Um, in the hospital, there are palliative care teams that are providing some support to patients who are very ill when their families are not allowed in. If you decide to stay home, what kind of support can you expect? Because it, you don't, it, it would be very hard to be doing this on your own if you are very sick or at the end of life and have made the decision to stay home. So the good news is there are many, many hospices. We are very lucky in the Bay Area to have hospice, excellent hospices in our community that can provide care, that are partnering with hospitals, that are getting protective equipment that they need to make visits to people who are, um, who are terminal and at home. Uh, hospices provide 24 seven telephone support. Now, while they don't provide hands-on support and that does fall to the family who are in, at home with you, they are available by the phone call in the middle of the night or on weekends with call. They can make sure you have access to their physician, at least if you can't get hold of your physician, the hospice, phys hospice physician is available by phone 24 seven, and they will make sure that whatever comfort meds you need um, are available to you in your home. Now, a number of people have asked about palliative care, which is a wonderful service. And I'd say at this point, almost every hospital in the country has a palliative care team. Um, and there are many palliative care clinics. However, the availability of home palliative care teams that will visit you at home is very, very limited. The Bay Area is fortunate to have PAMF, which does have a home palliative care, home palliative care team for um, PAMF patients. Um, however, it, their resources would be heavily taxed if everyone who was with serious illness needed their services. Um, and unfortunately, while there, uh, I'd say, for, you know, in the years to come, there should be more availability with home palliative care. At this point, it just isn't available. But if someone is terminal or within their final six months, there is plenty of availability of hospice care. Um, okay, what I do want to do now is show you, I'm going to share um, some of those resources I talked about, about the conversation. All right. Um, okay. And, um, all right. And I just want to make sure, are you seeing, all right, share. Yeah, Dr. Brown, we're not seeing it quite yet. It should, it, hmm. Okay, it says share with others, but okay, get sh uh, share, screen. share screen. That's what I was doing. I'm gonna try that one more time. And I, may, I have some technical support here. Wait, so let me go back to, um, all right. Um, okay, I want it. okay, share. All right, and Um, Perfect. We can see that now. Okay. Okay. Can you see that now? Yes. All right. So the first um, resource that I have on here is, an, is something called prepare. 
Um, and this is one, this was actually developed locally at UCSF, um, is a fabulous resource that will help people choose a medical decision maker if they haven't already done so. We, um, asking those questions on what matters most in life allows you to choose how much flexibility you want to give your decision maker and gives you tips on sharing your wishes as well as asking your doctors the right questions to make sure they um, understand your wishes uh, and are giving you the answers you need. Um, so the website, you know, prepareforyourcare.org is, it is all free resources um, and uh, goes step by step really very simply on how to um, go, how, how to do all of this. Um, okay, that's another resource. And I mentioned this, oops, okay, is uh, the Conversation Project, uh, another excellent resource. Uh, again, step by step what to even think about before you have the conversation so you're ready to have the conversation. Who might you want to have the conversation with? When do you want to do it? Um, really step-by-step step preparing you and giving you some of those icebreakers that I talked about. Um, excellent guidelines. Now, and they will say that you don't have to cover everything in one conversation. Do it in multiple conversations. Just really you know, test the waters if you feel like it, um, that the people, your, your loved ones may not agree with you. You don't have to agree, but hopefully they can listen and understand what you're trying to say. Again, Conversation Project, a fabulous resource. Uh, some of you may be familiar with um, Go Wish cards. Um, and this is when you can't, you just can't have the conversation. It's just the, the words don't come or um, they're not easy for you or they may not be easy for loved ones or friends that uh, you'd like to have the conversation with. And this is a card game um, available from GoWish.org. I know Avenidas has uh, also um, some of these card sets. And... Um, by, play, by choosing, that there's a lot of options of things that are important to you, things you value, and you, cho you choose maybe the three that are most important and share those cards with someone. Uh, again, a way to get it, the conversation started if you, you're having a hard time. And then another option, uh, and some of you may be familiar with Five Wishes, um, and this is, Five Wishes is more geared to end of life, um, and it, it's, again, prompts on how comfortable you'd want to be, how you want other people to treat you, um, what's really important for your loved ones to know, thinking about um, what you would like for your end of life, um, again, a really good resource. Um, I don't have the link on screen, um, but another resource uh, is the Coalition for Compassionate Care of California. Um, and they have both links to all these resources, as well as specific tips for COVID-19 for COVID on um, tips to be prepared, tips, um, it, you know, when you're isolated, uh, having your medicine list ready, um, making sure you're staying up on refills because it may be harder to get prescription refilled to stay ahead of it. Um, so they have lots of good tips. And that's, again, the Coalition for Compassionate Care of California. Um, and then finally, um, I sort of want to end with, you know, this, the title was End of Life, um, but I really want to focus on, uh, right now, it's, it's about how we're living each day, and I know these can be uh, scary times, but I'm hoping the talk allowed you to give you, gave you some words to use, gave you some a little more control, 
and empowered you to feel a little bit better about things that you are able to do at this time. So I love Snoopy's comment about every uh, day we will live and let's try living as best as we can during these times. Um, and now I'm going to, I guess, open it to questions. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Brown. So if any of you have questions at this time, I'm going to ask that you type it into the group chat and Dr. Brown will have the opportunity to respond to everybody. And we have a good amount of time. So thank you. Okay. And I do have a question. Um, somebody asking about how do you get a hospice referral and um, what's the difference with home hospice and hospice placement. Um, so if uh, hospices need to, to admit someone to hospice, they do need an order um, from a physician, but the physician can call in the order. Um, the, uh, hopefully they have seen you in the last year because they have to be able to send a medical note to the hospice. But a hospice can do an evaluation even without a hospice order. You can call up and say, you know, I think I may need it, my loved one may need it. Um, and hospices can do an evaluation to make sure um, that someone does appear to be in their final uh, days, weeks, or months of life. Um, home hospice, it, there is a team that, of um, hospice professionals that come to your home. The main person is a hospice nurse, uh, and she's what's called a case manager. She's your point person, your problem solver. Uh, she may come as little as once every two weeks if you don't need that much services to every day if it's needed. And the nurse may come an hour or two hours, but they're not there for a four hour, eight hour, 12 hour shift, but they're there to check in, to make sure you have your medicines, to answer questions, to provide support. Um, there's a hospice social worker uh, who, um, is there to provide, again, emotional, psychosocial support, both dealing with you, you and your family, dealing with the um, pending loss of life, as well as just overall support. Now, a lot of this during the pandemic may be done virtually. Um, they may not be making as frequent visits as they have in the past, but they're there a phone call away to provide support. There are chaplains that can provide spiritual support um, a, there's hospice physicians who may be available by the phone, depending on the hospice, a physician may be able to make a visit or not. Um, there are, um, home health aides who provide personal care. They may come in and be able to help with uh, bed bath or shower. Um, it's hard, especially when we're already isolated to have to deal with the pending death of a loved one at home when you're by yourself. And so hospice provides um, just immeasurable support during this time. Um, some people can't, you know, aren't able to manage the amount of personal care that's required at home. And then hospice can also provide support if someone is in a nursing home, assisted living facility, um, or if someone needs to move there and um, hospice goes wherever you live and provide that type of support. Um, uh, let's see, so I think that answered um, home hospice, uh, hospice provided in a nursing home, needing a doctor's order, but you don't need to go into the doctor's office to get that order. And the evaluation can be done even without the order, just then before they would actually admit you to their services would need your doctor's order. Um, Two doctors have to certify you for hospice, your own doctor or your primary care or your specialist who's referring you, um, and then the hospice doctor. Both have to say they think you have six months or less to live. Um, okay, I'm looking at other questions. Um, I, uh, what are your feelings using a fiduciary for this role? So um, many people do have a, uh, so I wanna make sure I understand the question there, fiduciary as serving as a healthcare proxy um, or sometimes just helping with some of the um, 
helping people walk through the conversation steps. I'm not sure uh, if someone could just clarify that. Um, some people choose not to have family members as their healthcare proxy because they just feel they're too emotionally connected and may not be able to make a decision um, that uh, they may not be able to say, take someone off life support, even though that's what the person would have wanted because they are feeling too emotionally connected. And so sometimes they choose a friend or sometimes they will choose a professional to serve in the role of a healthcare proxy. Um, and other question, um, what's the difference between going on hospice and the end of life option act? Very, very different. Um, hospice is a type of care that is, uh, invo as I said, involves a team of professionals, doctor, nurse, social worker, chaplain, home health aide, um, and provides the support, allows people to live well until they die. Um, doesn't hasten one's death, doesn't prolong one's life, but um, is allowing somebody to have best quality of life until they die. End of Life Option Act, uh, which was enacted in California a number of years ago, uh, if somebody, if two physicians certify that they have less than six months, um, then their primary care physician, and it's two weeks apart, uh, you make a request two weeks apart to your primary care physician, a second physician has to certify you have less than six months, that you're not operating under duress um, or coercion, uh, then your primary physician can write a prescription um, for a mixture or number of different medications. And the goal is uh, when you choose to use it uh, to end your life by taking those medications. Um, and you can um, be on hospice and decide to go through with the End of Life Option Act. You don't need to be, but, you, but hospices will um, sometimes support patients and families. Um, and uh, the only similarity is you, you both, you need to have a life expectancy of six months or less. I have not seen information about how the End of Life Option Act has been influenced by the pandemic. Um, there's a lot of signatures and forms that physicians are required to fill out um, for the End of Life Option Act, and I'm not sure if they're not physically seeing patients if the if it's if it's impacted them filling out those forms, um, and that might be interesting. Okay. Um, let me see um, another question. Some COVID patients are choosing to stay home. Um, okay, rather than go to the hospital. Yes. Um, so there are certainly COVID patients with mild symptoms that are choosing to stay home. They, um, and there are some patients with severe symptoms that are basically saying, I choose not to go on end of life support. That is not, not in line with my wishes. Um, I would rather be home with my family and be on hospice and being given medicines to ensure the best quality of life at home. Um, but it's a conscious decision not to go on life support. And that may be in line with what their, their values are. Um, the, uh, uh, can you comment on situations where the pulse can conflict with um, advanced healthcare directive. Um, so uh, their advanced healthcare directive is a um, is something that you know you've chosen. Uh, it's signed. You've chosen your proxy. Um, does not need to be signed by a physician. Uh, the um, and. Certainly well thought out. Some of them include wishes on certain treatments. Um, the POLST, or which stands for Physician Order for Life Sustaining Treatment, is a doctor's order, has to be signed by a physician. Um, and there are guidelines, again, during, um, during this pandemic, can it be done verbally uh, as a telephone order, especially for patients in 
facilities where the doctor may, may not be there and it, it's urgent that a pulse gets signed. So there are um, some ways to get verbal signatures or in, that weren't allowed prior to the pandemic that are being investigated. Um, but that's a physician's order and covers, um, there are just more specific instances. Um, do I want to go to the hospital? Do I want to go on life support? Do I want artificial nutrition? Um, do I want selective treatment, meaning antibiotics and IVs or comfort care? So those specific areas are covered and then discussion is help happens with patient or their healthcare proxy if the patient can't ha make those decisions. Um, and the doctor signs it and it's witnessed uh, and, um, and it's signed by the patient. Sorry, it's not when it's signed by the patient. Um, advanced care directives, again, depending on how, some of them are bare bones and just shows a healthcare proxy. Others go into very much more specifics what you might want with various uh, scenarios and instances. Um, they should be honored, but again, it's, they're not, um, it's not like a doctor's order. Pulse are doctor's orders, which doctors have to follow. So there might be conflict, hopefully not. Hopefully they're consistent and someone should review both their advanced care directives and their pulse to make sure that they are consistent. Um, ah, sorry, I, the, um, the sheltering in place and living alone. Um, I, the, I just was, just today was looking at the California um, Coalition for Compassionate Care website, which was talking about getting those uh, verbal order signatures for posts. Um, and there are specific guidelines on how physicians and patients can get those filled out when you can't go to the doctor's office. Um, so I would check that website and also um, speak to, uh, to physician, your own physician to make sure they're up on those guidelines on how to get those filled out. Um, in California, the range of costs for hospice, hospice is free. <laughs> that is the one of the best Medicare benefits, if, if you have Medicare and if you have Medicaid, um, Medi-Cal. And, and um, Medicare says if you are over 65, or if you are on Medicare, and if you choose comfort care rather than curative measures, and if you have less than six months to live, hospice care is totally free. Your, met, your comfort medicines, the services of the hospice team, um, the, the equipment, the hospital bed, the wheelchair, the oxygen are all free. Um, same for Medi-Cal. Now, they, um, the hospice, you, you basically sign over your medical care for your terminal condition to the hospice and they provide it all. Um, if you have other conditions not related, uh, you can get your regular uh, medical care. Most private insurances also provide hospice for free, but not all, some of them have a co-payment. Some of them have a maximum number of days, but um, if you have Medicare and Medi-Cal, there's no cost. Um, Okay, and Paula has said, yeah, she's willing to uh, have, serve as a consultant um, and dialogue as well. Um, yes, situation, okay, so uh, Paula is confirming that make sure your advanced care directive and your pulse match. Uh, a good t always a good time to review those documents, especially if they were done years ago um, and uh, that they can be changed and modified. Um, right, and then she is also, so Medicare, the hospice care the, is covered if you hire private aides, private pay caregivers, shift care, which may be anywhere from four to 24 hours, that is not covered by hospice, that's not part of the hospice benefit, those are private pay caregivers. Um, and if you live in a facility, hospice will not pay your room and board um, uh, in the care facility. Uh, it pays for the hospice care you receive from the facility. Um, okay, so yeah, she's emphasizing that it doesn't pay for private caregiving 
when the team is not present. Um, and frequently that caregiving will either fall onto the family or on um, hired caregivers. And that can be made more difficult during these times if you are alone um, or if your caregiver is frail on their own part, it's um, extremely difficult to do it by yourself uh, unless you are able to hire caregivers or um, at that point, many people do have to move into facilities where they receive their hospice um, services there. Um, okay, let me, uh, I think that uh, those, I think I've answered all of the questions. I don't know if there are any other questions. Um, I do want to say, I, um, many of you look like, it, I know it's really warm in Palo Alto today. <laughs> I think I saw that it was 75. I am talking to you from Alaska, <laughs> uh, so where I am sheltering in place with my daughter and granddaughter, and it's 40 degrees here, which is why I'm wearing a sweater and a scarf. So um, greetings, uh, this is, but as this is a subject near and dear to my heart, and um, thought it was a very important topic to share. When Paula asked me, I agreed uh, readily to, to do it. So I'm hoping you all are staying safe, healthy, and really my heartfelt regards, we will all get through, hopefully get through this. But if you, and if you have lost someone or someone is ill, I hope um, sending them healing thoughts as well. And condolences if you have lost someone during this time. Oh, Dr. Brown, thank you so much. Um, I found that incredibly useful, as always. Uh, so, and yes, thank you for coming to us from Alaska. My goodness. <laughs> um, so, uh, thank you. I want to um, share some information here with all of you before we sign off for today. So, I'm going to try to share my screen here. Let's see. That work okay. So what I have here, um, I just want to thank all of you. We had over 50 people joining us at one point today, so I appreciate you taking the time to uh, get this information and join in the community. Uh, what I have here is my contact information. If you have any questions or feedback, please feel free to send me an email. And as I mentioned, we are going to be doing this uh, weekly for the rest of the month of April. So next Wednesday on the 22nd, at the same time, we're going to have Dr. Ayati and Dr. Marina Martin. Uh, as he mentioned, they're both from Stanford Healthcare and they will be sharing uh, updated information and answering your questions. I wanted to let you all know, we're trying to make the registration process even easier so all of you who have registered for today's program will be automatically uh, signed up for next week's program. So what that means is you will get a, the login information the day prior. So you don't need to go onto the Avenues website or send anyone an email. You are all set for next week. And uh, what I have on the second half of the screen here is the information for Paula Wolfson. And Paula was actually uh, behind this whole town hall series. This was her idea. And she is here to help you and your families uh, work through these issues in a more um, intensive way. So what we have up here is her phone number and email. And at the bottom of the screen here, we have our website, which has a variety of resources for you. So I am hopeful that I will see you all virtually next week or hopefully the week after. I'm gonna give you an opportunity to write down that information. And um, I hope you have a good week and please stay well. All right, thank you so much for joining us today.